Okay, go ahead. There we go. Welcome everybody to Contemporary Issues here on July 11, 2022. And we are going to learn about thinking today. Ron Puning is going to do a book review about Think Again and talks about biases and thinking patterns applicable to all kinds of things in life, of course. So we're looking forward to that. Our usual announcements, uh, please mute yourself in the lower left corner to keep the background noise down, except when you're talking and we are recording today. And I know everybody on here will be kind to our speaker and not challenge him too much. And um, any other news or announcements? People been traveling or anything? Have anything to show? We are gonna have a summer, uh, summer school party on August 6th at Ron and Alice Puning's house. So that will be fun for anybody that can come and have a little dinner probably. And I'll send out the information and directions on that. So that's about it. Okay, Ron, looking forward to this about thinking. I've been thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody. All righty. Uh, here's a uh, cartoon from Peanuts that fits the uh, theme today. Uh, Snoopy's getting talked to by Charlie Brown, and uh, you can see it there. And Snoopy's final, final uh, statement is, has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? It's, it's, theory. Theory. it's theology book. And that kind of matches the title of the book we're talking about today, Think Again by Adam Grant. And uh, this book is actually on, a, on the bestseller list for the Rocky Mountain region. So it, it's nonfiction. And it's got some pretty good uh, compliments in there for some high, uh, well-known people like uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. And it's subtitled, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. And uh, I, I, of course, love the quote by Richard Feynman, a famous physicist. First principle is you must not fool yourself, and you're the easiest person to fool. And for those of us who listen to some rock music, I think, I think there were several songs that referred to uh, us being a little bit of a fool, particularly when it came to uh, the subject of love and, and rock music. And then, of course, I love uh, The Far Side, and I've titled this one, Think Again. This is called <laughs> Early Experiments in Transportation. Yes. And clearly it shows that, yeah, sometimes you do need to think again when you go through with something. Here's a slide I've used with three quotes on it from prior uh, lessons. Neil deGrasse Tyson, all people to think for themselves. And I'm always quoting the Roman Senator Seneca, who said, many might have attained the wisdom, but they not assumed they already possessed it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, from the movie The Way We Were, Robert Redford looks at Barbara Streisand and says, are you so sure about the things you're sure about? Okay. Well, we know for sure in our age, knowledge is increasing dramatically, uh, particularly medical knowledge, although it's not uh, exclusively medical knowledge, it's just expanding. But uh, in 1950, medical knowledge had doubled in a period of 50 years. 1980, medical knowledge was doubling every seven years. By 2010, medical knowledge was doubling in three and a half years. And uh, in, in general, in 2011, the average American consumed twice as much information per day as they did 25 years earlier. So we're, we're in an information age. We're being bombarded with info, and we can find more info in a hurry than we ever could before uh, via the internet. But it does mean, with the accelerated pace of change, we need to question our beliefs more readily than before. Things are changing so fast, we need to stop and ask, is this true? Is it changed? Do I need to rethink this from what I thought a decade ago? Certainly true with a lot of medical knowledge, and it's certainly true with a lot of other 
knowledge. Well, for those of you that like the Olivia Newton-John in Greece, she sings a song in there called Hopelessly Devoted to You. And if you recall the words to that, she says, my head is saying, fool, forget him. My heart is saying, don't let go. So it's the age old strife between our heart and our head. Hopelessly devoted. And they say, generally as humans, our imperfect little minds, we favor feeling right more than being, being right. We want good feelings. Uh, we don't care if they're right or wrong, but it does mean that we need to discard outdated information that has been supplanted by scientifically updated info. I remember as a little kid, I was maybe nine years old. I'm riding my bicycle up by the high school next to my house. And here comes the football team off the field. It's about 1960. And it's a hot fall day. They've just been practicing. The players are going up to the big drinking fountain, taking sups of water and spitting it out. Because around 1960, they erroneously, erroneously were telling people that you, if, if it's a hot summer day, you don't want to run up to a water fountain and gulp a, you know, a big bunch of water real fast or chug a Pepsi or whatever. And of course, we know today that's baloney. That's, you do want to chug that. Uh, I remember my dad said his parents would give he and his brother castor oil every Friday to, quote, clean them out. I yeah. thought that was good medical practice. And so I want to pose to the class, are there any things you can think of from your family or your grandparents that were taught as uh, good things to do that we now know are pretty much nonsense? Think of anything? My grandmother used to eat Vicks <laughs> for sore throat. For sore throat. Yeah, okay. she would swallow the, the gel. Uh, yeah, would not recommend. <laughs> All right. Well, there's the classic example of bleeding by leeches that was. Oh, uh, yeah. First thought <laughs> is being good and then thought is being bad. And now it's back in some use. Really? Uh, I think yeah. um, when I yeah. was, uh, I think when I was small or, you know, not, not small, but I was a young kid. And somebody told me where babies came from. <laughs> and I thought, what a ridiculous idea. You know, you know that's not <laughs> possible. And I went home and told my mother, I said, you know what so-and-so told me? That babies come from inside uh, uh, mothers. And, uh, and, you know, then I got the truth. You know, I got the story. But, you know, it's, <laughs> that's a ridiculous idea. You know, how, how could that happen? How could that be? <laughs> the basic thing of well, life. Some, something a little more current. I remember about 20 years ago when eggs were looked on with disfavor because of high cholesterol. Well, it turned out to be that the cholesterol wasn't all that harmful, that the eggs, egg cholesterol wasn't all that harmful and that we could go ahead and eat eggs as we, as we choose, um, maybe using a little bit of caution, but boy, there was a time there when they thought that you just shouldn't be eating more than one or two eggs at most per week. Yeah, yeah you'll probably get into it, Ron, about how we should think skeptically about science and medicine and religion and what's a good accepting and what's a good uh, skeptical attitude Politics yeah. In that too yeah we're going we're going to look into that here a little bit uh, for those that have taken Latin and Diana did I see you on this morning I think so uh, uh, yes so, I am on okay. Cicero probably had more of his writings uh, passed down than any other uh, Roman person, but he was quite both a politician and a lawyer. And he, he said that people are primarily ruled by emotions. 
And if you're attempting to persuade an audience, he said, don't try to appeal to their logic and reason. He said, stir their emotions. And that could frequently overpower facts, evidence, and even the truth. And he said that 2,000 years ago, and unfortunately, it's still true today. All right. There's many, many modes and facets of your mind. Let me throw this thing off. What is that? <laughs> okay. Three, three common modes of our mind that we can slip into, particularly if we're arguing a point or something. We can go into the preacher mode. Uh, this is when uh, our sacred beliefs are in jeopardy and we delivered a, a sermon to pr protect and promote our ideals. There's the prosecutor mode, and we go in the prosecutor mode when we recognize flaws in other people's reasoning, and we're determined to correct them and, and point them out immediately in front of the jury. And then, of course, there's the politician mode when we seek to win over an audience, get them riled up and in our favor, and we campaign and lobby for their approval. Okay, and then there's the what we consider the the better mode, which is the scientist mode, which searches for the truth. And you learn to doubt um, everything you know to some degree, or at least have a pretty good idea of the certainty or uncertainty of it. You're curious about what you don't know, and you update your views based on new data, not new propaganda. You develop hypotheses, test the hypotheses, think uh, seek solid evidence and think probabilistically. That means when you look at things, you say, what are the odds of that being true? And uh, when like 15 witnesses come forth and all are independent, they're all not in one family, and they all independently confirm something, you can say probabilistically, mathematically, it sure looks like what their story, if it's cohesive, is, is true. So hopefully in the science mode or scientist mode, you uh, stress humility over pride, curiosity over closure, and doubt over certainty. Uh, here's a, what they call a Venn diagram. And again, the, some of the shortcomings of those three modes I pointed out. Oh, right. that's great to know. Your internet connection is unstable. Okay. Uh, there's Don't the politician worry. mode where your views get swayed by popularity. And uh, I noticed uh, recently J.D. Vance, who wrote the book Hillbilly Elegy, is now going to run for Senate in Ohio. And he just came out and said, well, those things I said about not trusting Trump, I've rethought them. And, you know, he's kind of, he's like a weather vane, it looks like. He's changing his views now that he's trying to run for office and gain popularity. Then there's the prosecutor mode where you're hell bent rather than discovering. And then there can be the preacher mode where you pre sometimes present pure theory as truth and attack any thoughtful critique as sacrilege. This Venn diagram shows some of the uh, shortcomings and some of the strengths of those different modes of thinking. I never thought of Trump okay. as being in preacher uh, mode. Peanuts cartoon. Here's the Peanuts cartoon I love. <laughs> you can all read it. And now the number one hit song across the nation. The nation's in sad shape. <laughs> okay. Beliefs I stand by. And this is a little chart. How steadfast is the idea? And for this one person, it says they show the latest scientific studies don't rate very high. New evidence doesn't rate very high. But what does rate high, that thing I heard from my friend's brother in 2006. And uh, the story I like to tell is the analogy of the hitching post. There's a lot of people who hitch their minds to a hitching post. But the hitching post itself often isn't 
grounded in anything. And we can sometimes say that's, that's partly true of the Bible. Some aspects of the Bible are like a hitching post that's on wobbly ground. They're not grounded into uh, demonstrable scientific fact. And uh, so we have to be careful where we ground our beliefs. And when you make an argument, if you start from a hitching post that isn't grounded and continue from there, you're often going to come up with the wrong answer. There was a song, it was a, a, a real bestseller back around World War I, the 1915 era. And it was written by Irving Berlin, a very famous composer. And the song was, they were all out of step but my gym. And this is a lady watching the uh, parade of uh, doughboys going down the street. And uh, the, her argument was her, her son was not in step with the rest of them. And her argument was they were all out of step with her son. Was it she about Jim Watson? With bias and credit. Is, is it what? Was it about Jim Watson? It probably was. Did we lost yet? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, no, Jim was, in, Jim was in step. We all know that. Okay. Well, here's a term that uh, Jerry Butler mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago in a, in a lesson. The term cognitive dissonance. And Jerry said that they said, one of the things that has to happen to bring people out of a, a wrong mode of thought, if they're locked into something, be it a, a cult or a religious precept that's just not right, or a political thought that's wrong, or a racial prejudicial thought, um, he said their cognitive dissonance has to come up to a level it starts jolting them and makes them upset and makes them start to rethink. So cognitive dissonance is a mental conflict occurs when your beliefs don't line up with your actions or, you, or else your beliefs don't line up so that they fit together. It's like a puzzle where the pieces don't get together and you've got to stay in little independent sections of your mind uh, where you don't have to integrate uh, the ideas. Eddie Arnold, the great country singer, did a song, Make the World Go Away. And I like, I like that song. Make the world go away and get it off my shoulder. And that's kind of the theme song of the person stuck in cognitive dissonance, where things in their mind don't line up. Uh, one way of dealing with cognitive dissonance is to... Uh, if you get some of your um, heroes start, when facts start coming out about your favorite hero or your favorite politician that you don't like, you can, you can say, well, quick, go out and get some more evidence that's favorable to our opinion. Uh, for example, but he only cheated on 30% of his tax returns. Seven out of 10 times, uh, he was good. Okay, you, you still with me? I'm, I'm getting an occasional unstable internet signal on this computer. Oh, you're okay. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Okay, good, okay. We're good. But, uh, so we, go ahead. We often, uh, uh, we go out sometimes and if we, uh, we find out that our hero like in the uh, 1990s Chicago Black Sox scandal, there was a little boy who was purportedly asked one of the players, say it ain't so, Joe, say it ain't so, when he was uh, indicted for uh, throwing the World Series. And, and we tend to do that. We want our heroes to tell us if they fall uh, that, that they're okay. And we want to go out and pick more evidence uh, to justify someone. Uh, there's the famous saying from Shakespeare, and this is out of the play Hamlet, speaker's Marcellus, and he says to uh, Horatio, his comrade, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. 
Does anyone remember that from your school days studies of, uh, yeah, I see a few hands going up there. And I want to pose the question, does anybody have some rather dramatic moments in their lives where they came to a, a dramatic sudden revelation of something that really shook them real hard, real fast? Good examples would be, uh, I think one of the most shocking moments I had was when I walked in from my garage door when our house had been burglarized. Oh. And I saw the broken glass and the ransacked room. And it was one of the bigger shocks I can remember going through. Mm -hmm. Well, for, from, for me, from theology, Ron, when I first read about uh, the gay passages in the Bible and how they were not talking about homosexuality today, but about child abuse and other things. It kind of came together for me and was a eye-opening revelation to me that it was a different type of thing they were talking about back then. Okay. In our thinking process, we have, we have to deal with both bias and logical fallacy. Bias is when you go in with a strongly preconceived filter or thought on that you got to overcome. An example I've got here is uh, someone who says, my son is superior to any collegiate math student in Colorado. And maybe you know, they believe that. My kid is number one at this in the whole state. Uh, it's a, maybe it's an inbuilt bias. Uh, that's, a, that's an example. A logical fallacy is where, even if we're unbiased, we can have terrible logic. You see plenty of examples of that every day. Example of lo a logical fallacy, a, a guy says, my stockbroker was right on his last three stock picks from me. So I can confidently put my entire portfolio in the stock he recommended today. Here's an example of a, a logical fallacy. And, uh, I'm thinking of doing a lesson in the future on some of the most common logical fallacies. So we've got to guard against both bias and bad logic. And most of us see good examples of both of those every day. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about confidence versus competence. Uh, the armchair quarterback is where the confidence exceeds confidence, where, where the person thinks they know it all and has all the answers. And uh, I've got to criticize the late President Trump uh, on this one. I know more than all the generals. I alone can fix this. You start making statements like that, you've got the uh, armchair quarterback syndrome. And then there's the imposter syndrome where the person thinks they're an imposter and they don't have, where their confidence in something actually exceeds their confidence. And probably some of us have had that experience in life where you're pretty good at something, but your confidence level on it is way down. So you need to build up your confidence uh, that you can do something. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, and this is a whole bunch of analyses that they've done in general, Women typically underestimate their leadership skills, while men typically overestimate theirs. That is a fact that has now been borne out by dozens of studies. So uh, the men are likely to be the armchair quarterbacks, and the ladies are more likely to be the uh, less confident. And there's a, a famous thing, uh, a study was done, it's called the uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect. And Dunning and Kruger studied people who scored the lowest on tests of logical reasoning. So they gave some tests and uh, they found that the people that had the most inflated opinion of their skills believed they did better than 62% of their peers. In other words, the people that uh, did lousy on that had the Dunning-Kruger syndrome thought they were in the upper third 
when they were in the lower 10, 12%. They were way down on some skill, but their ego, their confidence level was way up. And uh, one of the sayings about the Dunning-Kruger effect is the first rule of Dunning-Kruger club is you don't know you're in the Dunning-Kruger club. Oh. You're so confident in the stuff you believe that you don't realize uh, you're caught at what they call the peak of Mount, uh, oh, here we go. The, you're caught at the peak of Mount Stupid. They find as you start to gain knowledge on something, you, you start, but you tend to have the fast relative to your knowledge. And you reach a point where you're at what they call the peak of Mount Stupid. And they say, don't get stumped on the, uh, the summit of Mount Stupid. As you keep on learning, you often realize, hmm, maybe I'm not the world's expert on uh, biochemistry yet, even though I finished the 101 course. And as we grow a little older and sometimes a little smarter, we realize perhaps we're not the genius we first thought we were. So that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. And uh, a metacognitive skill is the ability to think about your thinking. Uh, for those of you, you that ever listened to a Prairie Home Companion, and that's been off the air for a while, but uh, Garrison Kyler, who was creator of the Prairie Home Companion radio show, talked about the imaginary Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. And, uh, there's a good bit of that in our society. They did a study on managers in general from a lot of countries. You can probably read, but the x axis is the average management practices score. This is real scores that they measured on managers to determine how good they were. And that's called reality, how, they re how good, how effective they really were. But then they asked managers to give themselves self-scores, score themselves in these areas. And sure enough, and this is especially unsurprising since there's more managers that are men, uh, the data almost always fell above the line. Way more people uh, fool themselves and think they're a lot better uh, than they are. All right. Again, we favor feeling right more than being right. Here's a cartoon I love. Does anyone know, uh, read this in the morning? <laughs> yeah, I read it. <laughs> I read that. <laughs> okay. But here's one I like. <laughs> and, uh, Sherman and his wife and their little son are outside of Seattle talking about the Space Needle. And uh, Sherman said it was left by aliens and it flies away every hundred years and then returns. And then the wife says, you realize your father's full of baloney. <laughs> and the little fellow says, yeah, but it's fun. This was a study showing uh, new medical students and uh, they, they graphed their actual accuracy in diagnosing. And it was better than 50%, better than 60%. It got better over time. But their perceived accuracy generally always exceeded their actual accuracy. So again, there's a, a lot of overconfidence among beginners on things. And so the thing uh, the author says is we need to find the sweet spot. Um, Confidence is plotted on the uh, x-axis, and you certainly want to try to get your confidence in an area, uh, a skill, uh, whatever, be it something simple, something complex. You definitely want to try to get your confidence uh, to the right. Uh, and you want to get your confidence up, too. But where you get into real problems is where there's a huge disconnect, uh, particularly if your confidence level your Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, if your confidence gets way above your real confidence. 
that's when you really do stuff that's stupid. Uh, I like that t-shirt that, and I've got it. Determination, feeling, that feeling you get right before you're doing something incredibly stupid. <laughs> so a person that's real high on uh, the Dunning-Kruger scale, thinks they can do everything, thinks they've got it all down, uh, will do like this fisherman's doing with the uh, grizzly bear, not drop it when they should. Okay. Uh, you have what we would call a dictator policing your thoughts to some degree. Everybody's got a little dictator inside of them. The question is, how strong is that dictator and, and what are they doing to our, uh, our, our thought policing? If you've got Kim Jong-un uh, policing your thoughts, you're in bad shape. And to some degree, any organization that's heavy on religion and politics can often put up a barrier in our minds uh, that starts policing us. And if we're not careful, uh, put up a filter that probably shouldn't be there. When we have a core belief question, we tend to shut down rather than open up. We call that the totalitarian ego. And our amygdala or lizard brain really kicks in. Our emotions really come in. How dare they say that? Of course, on the other side of the coin, there are some beliefs that you definitely should have very strongly. And if they are backed up by logic, good thought and uh, uh, good evidence, then there's nothing wrong with having a, a strong filter. But the problem is too many people put up filters uh, that lack uh, solidity in terms of uh, scientific basis, factual basis, uh, and being free from uh, bias that is just overwhelming. So uh, it's mentioned the inner dictator does come in handy when someone attacks our character or intelligence. And uh, presented with someone else's argument, we're adept at spotting the weaknesses, but when it comes to our own, we're often blind. We're often blind to our own prejudice. This is some bias. Uh, Carl Sagan said, if it can be destroyed by the truth, it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. So it's, a, it's an encouragement to all of us to look for truth and not get stuck in islands of uh, fantasy. Uh, here's a cartoon. Penelope liked living in a bubble. Wrong opinions are often shielded in filter bubbles when we only see information that supports our conviction. And then we go to echo chambers where you, you only hear from people who intensify and invalid and validate them. Uh, there was a cult in the movie, uh, a Bond movie called the Octopus Cult. They were uh, kind of a religious uh, ladies cult. All right. Um, Another thing we need to do is sometimes learn to detach the present from the past and ask people to look at these bubbles across here. And the, the gray is the past you. And the more white is the present you. And they ask people, how much do you see your past and present you changed? Are, they, are you exactly the same as, say, 50 years ago? Or do you see some substantial change, a whole lot of change, or almost entire change? Uh, they say over time, rethinking who you are appears to be mentally healthy. So it's good to go back and look at your own mind, your thoughts, who you are, self-evaluate, uh, and... Uh, so there's nothing wrong with having changed as long as you can tell a coherent story of how you got from the past to the present. But uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good study to look at how people are willing or unwilling to change. If you feel like you're locked in 100% with exactly who you are when you were 16 years old, as you are when you're 66 years old, that's probably not good. And they said, uh, 
In one study, they found that people who felt detached from their past selves, in other words, felt like they weren't locked into who they were when maybe they were age 16 or 26, uh, but people who could realize that they can change, they have changed, they could change, were likely to become less depressed. People who have more depression tend to be locked into thinking they're exactly who they were at age 12 or something. Okay, then values versus beliefs. Uh, the book that the authors say, who you are should be a question of what you value, not what you believe. And when we say what you believe, we mean opinions. You should, you should think of yourself more on, I value this. And, we, and hopefully principles you value are excellence, generosity, freedom, fairness, security, integrity. Those are values, those aren't opinions. And you should strive in life to have an undergirding of solid values, not uh, a whole array of opinions that have possibly been dictated to you by other people that are just sayings or things that aren't grounded uh, in reality. Here was, a, here was a bumper sticker that was uh, popular when the Taliban did its thing. And it certainly is a pretty good description, the criticism of the, the Taliban, how so many people in the Taliban and extremist Islam uh, got caught in and still are caught in uh, indoctrinated thinking. It said science flies you to the moon, religion into skyscrapers. Uh, so see yourself, they say, the author says, someone who values curiosity, learning, mental flexibility, and searching for knowledge. See yourself as your values and searching for those values, not for grasping hold of a bunch of debatable opinions. And also learn to have the right level of conviction. Um, they've done some studies. Instead of asking people uh, when they look at the future, they, they say it's good to think of, do you think this is going to happen? Instead of thinking yes or no, they think it's healthy to think of what are the odds of that, that happening? What are the odds of a major uh, new comet being spotted next year? And if you say it's 50-50, uh, that's, that's a bad guess, that the odds aren't that high. If you say the odds are a million to one, you're, you're, you're way off. The odds are much better of uh, spotting a, a, an unknown comet next year than 50-50. So it's said the best decision-making in your life involves when you can apply probabilistic methods. And if you think about it, you don't have a whole lot of biases to come in if you're playing cards. And uh, if, if you're playing poker, you start thinking of odds more practically. You know that if you have two cards from this hand and you draw three, the odds of getting a royal flush, if you're a smart card player, are incredibly remote. Possible, but incredibly remote. Certainly, uh, if you've got two of these cards and you draw three, the odds of getting a royal flush drawing three cards is nowhere near one in a hundred. The odds are much longer than that. So they say it's good for the mind and good for your, uh, your thought process to think uh, probabilistically. Certainly you hope they do that when somebody's on a, on a jury. Uh, then there's the saying, I'm entitled to my opinion. Yes, inside our heads, but if you express your opinion in written or spoken word, it is a responsibility to ground them in logic and facts, share our reasoning with others, and change our minds when better evidence emerges. For some, their opinions are their identities, when their values ought to be their identities. So make sure you're 
your identity is more based on your values and not on your opinion. Because a lot of people, when they get their opinions challenged, uh, questioning them is a threat, a threat to their very selves. And they often get very angry. Okay. Well, I've talked a lot. We're going to finish up today with uh, one more subject area. And that is uh, trying to change somebody's mind. Uh, the book does have pretty much a whole chapter on trying to change someone's mind, or at least lead them a little bit more in one direction. And the author says he feels the key is to ask better questions. Practice the art of persuasive listening. Uh, when someone made some ridiculous statement, uh, ask them how they would make their views a reality. And this sometimes makes them realize the limits of their uh, crazy thoughts. Like if someone says, let's put 50 caliber machine guns up at the border and just mow down everybody that comes in. And you can come up back with, well, think, think about how would you do that? And they'd say, well, we deploy the 101st Airborne every year and put a soldier every uh, 50 yards. So try to get them to uh, think through what they're really saying. Uh, here's, a, here's a picture out of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, Dorothy and her three friends are going down the trail. And there's a sign they come up across that says, Haunted Forest, Witch's Castle, One Mine, One Mile, I'd Turn Back If I Were You. So uh, also it, it's, it says, uh, ask what evidence would change your mind? If someone says, I'm sure so-and-so is innocent. And then if you ask him, what evidence would it take for you to believe that so-and-so isn't uh, uh, innocent? And that's, that's a way to make people start to think and ask how high and how much evidence do you need to get uh, a change of mind. Also ask people how they form their original opinion. Uh, for example, you say, hmm, that's an interesting thing you thought you've got there. Uh, where did you get that idea? How did you formulate this uh, opinion? So I, I highly recommend the book uh, from, from this standpoint, because it's got a real good chapter on uh, this subject. Uh, for those that remember the Rogers and Hammerstein uh, story, South Pacific, uh, there's a song in there where Lieutenant Cable sings, you've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. And when this musical came out in the 1952, in March of 1953, in the Georgia legislature, uh, the play South Pacific was deemed as offensive. And uh, some of the Georgian legislatures, two of them there by name, uh, criticized and said, we shouldn't play this uh, musical in the state of Georgia because it attacks our uh, thoughts relative to uh, racial acceptance. Also, they say we should approach disagreements as dances, not a battle. Okay, well, I've talked a great deal, probably too much. I wanna open it up. And uh, what are your thoughts on uh, changing your mind? Have you changed your mind on things? Uh, do you consider yourself open-minded or not very open-minded? Do you think you've reached an age, like me, almost 70? Do you feel like, I've learned it all by now. I don't need to change or I can't change. What are some thoughts out there? One of the things that I have changed my mind about uh, when I came here, we were pretty much told from the pulpit, uh, you have to vote uh, Republican uh, because you have to be pro-life uh, as a Catholic. And uh, my, I have two nieces that are 
uh, nurses <clears throat> and they work uh, in children's hospital. And my niece um, uh, really told me what the reality is uh, for women uh, and women that just simply have chosen abortion. And what I have done uh, in my own mind, because I go to church, <clears throat> and particularly one uh, deacon will always pray for uh, uh, the end of abortion. <clears throat> I now pray for pregnant women. And I look uh, to ways that I can support pregnant women rather than say, uh, we have to change this uh, uh, way versus um, uh, that law that we have uh, that <clears throat> from 1973. Um, and that it's more important uh, to work as a government to uh, support people uh, to have insurance uh, and that uh, contraceptives are uh, paid by the insurance companies and that the, my whole uh, change is now, uh, what can we do for pregnant women? Okay. It's a different perspective, Diane, different way to look at it. Yep. Other thoughts on uh, changing your minds? Are we too old to change our minds? I think as we get older, it's easier to change my mind. I don't know why that is, but <laughs> experience, I guess. And uh, I certainly was more certain about things when I was younger. Accepting the mysteries now. Okay. Mm -hmm. They say it's tougher to pull people into religious cults when they get older. Mm. Uh, it's easier to pull people into a religious cult uh, when they're very young than it is when they get uh, much older. I know uh, I had a history teacher in high school who led some Marines in at uh, some of the Pacific Island invasions. And he said a disproportionate number of kids 18 and 19 would get killed. He said a lot of the men that were a little more mature, 26, 28, 30, would think twice before charging a machine gun nest with uh, grenades uh, hanging from their uh, teeth. <laughs> Well, there's certainly also a, a whole industry of uh, authors writing about thinking these days. There's all kinds of books on thinking decisions, thinking patterns, how to think better. Seems like we're paying more attention to it these days. And, this, and the subject of cognitive dissonance, uh, we all all have to deal with it every day. And there's at least at least a few things in all of our minds that are a little bit disconnected and don't quite fit together perfectly. And we we tend to not worry about some of those. But if it's something really critical, uh, like a like a major medical decision, and uh, if, if, if we're blind to some of the, the facts, if we throw off, if your doctor tells you, you've got a serious problem with uh, something, and if you just cast it aside and pretend it isn't there, you could, you could be in real trouble. One, one uh, thing that's concern I have about today is if you have a question, something that's troubling you, uh, you don't know what to think about it. Uh, there are so many sources of information. You know, you can you know, go in books and the internet, uh, uh, speakers. 
there are so many sources of uh, information to to organize your thinking. That's what's great now about uh, you know years past. I was going to comment that so often, and I'm thinking of youth now, but I guess it could be all through our lives. We're taught about facts and. Um, I think we need to think about how to think critically and creatively and practice that, have experience at it and look at an issue and think, okay, what are the facts? Okay, now how can I critically examine that or how can I creatively examine that? And uh, I think um, I'm not putting down the child left behind as a testing thing, but I think for a while in our educational system, we had, um, focus on facts. We were testing for facts. And um, so I think uh, if, they, if youth especially, and this is true of all ages, don't have experience at critical thinking or don't have experience at creative thinking, nothing changes. Especially today, Judy, with the internet, social media, politicians saying they've got alternate facts as we know happens uh it's really brought up the need for critical thinking and even us older folks uh when we get scammed on the internet we see things we think we just automatically assume it is a friend that's texting yeah. us or emailing us and we don't stop to think it could be a scammer yeah we you know, fall no, I have found that as I've gotten older, I tend to be a little more critical and pull things apart and look at it from, you know, different directions mm -hmm. than when I was, you know, probably a teenager, um, you know, when I was a lot more susceptible to what everybody else was saying around me. As I hope a lot of us do, but obviously the scammers target older people because a lot of older people don't critically think like that, too. I also think it's important to listen across generations, that we listen to our children and we listen to our grandchildren and they listen to us um, sharing ideas because we know how human development evolves. listening two ears and one mouth <laughs> that's good so true well that's one thing i like about the methodist church is they do encourage us to think for ourselves and not just take the traditional line or the liberal line without thinking about it mm -hmm. I can think of a few times in my career where uh, something was pointed out to me and I came to realize I didn't know as much about something as I thought I had. Mm -hmm. Even didn't, if you asked me how I performed on a certain task, I would have rated myself higher than I would have a year later when I had a better chance to get some more feedback and see the results. I've learned that one thing to be aware of. How about that statement about uh, women being uh, less likely to be uh, Dunning-Kruger club members? Any, any thoughts from you ladies on that? Why, why are you ladies, are, why are you less likely to be, uh, you know, stand up on a pedestal and think you have all the answers to those guys? I think in our generation, it's because that was the way we were taught. Uh, women are um, supposed to let the men take precedence. At least it was in my family. And, um, you know, it's a hard one. What, what was that graph you were showing with the gray and the white? Um, yeah. Ball uh, <clears throat> overshadowing. Those past and present years. There's an awful, especially in our generation. I know um, our daughter is more um, 
self-confident, uh, stands up for what she believes. Um, so I, I think maybe a generational thing too. Mm -hmm. I, I feel what sorry for our vice president, Harris. I mean, I think uh, women that are in positions today are much more criticized than the men, uh, particularly. I'm, I'm thinking of Vice President Harris. She has been criticized so, and, uh, and, uh, and, and other people, other women that are uh, in um, commanding positions. I think uh, they're looked at um, uh, in, in a way that, why are you, why do you think you know so much compared to what a man uh, it would be he would um, would is not criticized as much. Jim Watson, did you start to say something? Well, yes, I was going to say that I've learned to beware of someone who uh, believes they have all the answers. <laughs> no, no one has all the answers. And you know, and what's great about uh, you know the hu human uh, situation is that uh, we have fresh minds coming all the time. Mm -hmm. It belongs to the young. There's a point when you have to stop listening to mm -hmm. the old folks and listen to what the youth are saying. The next time somebody, uh, there's a, a few people that I associate with that are in, are definitely in the Dunning-Kruger Club. And then the next time they pontificate something to me and start preaching at me, I may just say, wow, how long have you been in the Dunning-Kruger Club? <laughs> and, they'll look at me and, and they'll look at me with a, and, and I won't explain. I said, look at, I'll just say, look it up. <laughs> may I tell you a story? A little bit louder, uh, Jim. A little bit louder. Jim. May I tell you a story? Yeah. A man was uh, having trouble with his wife. They weren't weren't getting along. She was always criticizing him for this or that, or uh, you know, just giving him a bad time about everything. And he was uh, having a physical with his doctor, and he told his doctor about that problem. And uh, the doctor said, "Well, uh, uh, take uh, drink some water." And just swish it around in your mouth, uh, and and don't so, uh, swallow it or until uh, until after your wife leaves the room. And uh, you may have heard this story. Uh, and time after he was at the doctor's again, and he uh, told them about the the experience. And said, it really worked, Doc. It, it was it just worked the charm. And they said, well, the water do. And the doctor says, well, the water does nothing. Keep in your mouth shut. It does a little. Does a little. <laughs> 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 Which Jim reminds me, and it was in one of the uh, videos, uh, humor is so important. Um, if you can come back with a little bit of humor or lightheartedness, it really uh, saves the situation. You know, you could be arguing forever, but just a little humor zing in there and it yeah. really helps. Relative to that, Judy, mm -hmm. they have found that people with a better sense of humor tend to be more humble yeah. and more open. Yeah. There's yeah. a real mm -hmm. super dictatorial. I've got all the answers. People rarely tell jokes, and uh, yeah. yeah, they take themselves so seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we should probably wrap up. We made it through our hour. Computers were okay. Ron, thank you for another good presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ron. Helps us think better. That's right. Okay, next well, week. Bring your book recommendations. We'll talk all about books next week. Okay. Good. Thank you. We'll see what everybody's been reading and likes. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us this week. Thank you. You too, Ron. You late. See you later. Thank Steve. you again, Ron. Okay.
Did the wedding go off okay? You said it did. Yes. Yes, okay. it was great, Ron. We had a good, good time. You didn't have a 